Okay, uh, welcome one and all. Um, welcome to the SIBS Victoria Air Tightness of Building Seminar. Uh, my name is Jeff Robinson and be, on behalf of the Victorian Committee of SIBS, I'd like to welcome you all to our monthly technical seminar. Um, this seminar is on a very important contemporary topic, the air tightness uh, testing of buildings. And we've invited a panel of three experts to share their knowledge and to present on this topic for about 40 minutes. Um, and then uh, they will answer any questions you may have, uh, which you can ask via the Q&A box that's uh, up on your screen. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is to um, uh, run through, we're gonna have a welcome to country and then I'm going to run through uh, a number of the up and coming SIBS activities. And then I'm going to introduce uh, our first speaker. Uh, he will then give his presentation and I'll uh, then introduce our following two speakers after that. So the first thing I'd like to do is to um, uh, acknowledge the traditional owner of the lands on which we're meeting tonight. So um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the different uh, participants in this webinar are located and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd like to tell you all about the SIBS uh, Australia and New Zealand Young Engineers Awards. It's a competition that's been recognizing outstanding emerging talent among the building services industry for the last four years. This year, SIBS is asking emerging professionals what changes need to occur in planning the built environment today to help achieve a desirable, high performing, sustainable built environment one decade on. And the winners of each award will be recognized with a trophy and a cash prize of $1,000 and a chance to present their views at the virtual seminar 2020 vision for a 2030 reality uh, seminar on the 9th of September. The entries uh, deadline has been extended to the 2nd of June. So there's still time to nominate a team member or yourself uh, if you've less than seven years of industry experience. There are tips from the uh, uh, past uh, winners at sibs.org.au. Um, so um, I mentioned the uh, SIBS ANZ virtual uh, seminar 2020. Um, that's going to be held on the um, um, uh, 9th of September. It's the first time we've held this uh, seminar uh, virtually and um, we're expecting lots of folk from throughout Australia and New Zealand. And we have a, a stellar lineup of uh, speakers. You can see some of them, uh, the folk on the, in the picture there. Um, the title is uh, A Vision of a 2020 Reality. The program brings experts from both sides of the Tasman to share exemplar case studies of regenerative and net zero building practices, as well as new information on future policy changes that building owners and services engineers need to understand to minimize future risks to assets, both new and existing. And you can register at sibs.org.au and for a limited time, the tickets start from uh, $99. So uh, jump in there and get the uh, some good value. So the last um, thing I wanted to uh, talk about, or second last thing, is uh, that SIBS ANZ will continue to provide CPD sessions in the webinar format um, to protect the health and safety of our members and the industry in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, the wonderful thing about these presentations now is that certainly we're organizing uh, uh, as we do in Victoria, we organize one per month. But the wonderful thing is that you too can now, uh, sitting in your own um, bedroom or wherever your workplace is, um, uh, join in a whole series of seminars um, 
uh, from all over Australia, which different and New Zealand, which different Civ chapters are putting on. And you can see some of the ones that we have coming up on the 7th of July, there's education as an asset class um, uh, given by Graham Spencer and Alex Wessing from HDR and uh, David Keenan from CB, uh, CBRE. Uh, you've got the Civs Yen, Day in the Life of a Buildings Engineer, which is happening at 5.30 on Thursday, the 9th of July. We've got another presentation from Sibs Queensland on mental health and suicide in the workplace at five o'clock on Tuesday on the 14th of July. And uh, you have a we're having a presentation on humidification and um, psychometrics uh, at 1.30 on Tuesday, the 28th of July. So um, uh, there are lots and lots of opportunities to see uh, some fantastic presentations and um, uh, you can register at sibs.org.au and all of these counts count towards CPD points. And then the last thing uh, I'd like to remind folk about is a reminder that the ARBS ex uh, exhibitions has announced that ARBS 2020 has been rescheduled to the 15th uh, to the 17th of February uh, 2021 at the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre. It's Australia's biggest uh, HVAC and R trade uh, event, and it'll showcase hundreds of new products and technologies, which are set to shape the future with a focus on emerging trends and technology in the area of smart IoT solutions, automation, controls, refrigerants, energy efficiency, plus a lot more. And over three huge days, visitors can connect with manufacturers and distributors to see the latest products and applications while exploring leading design and innovation in HVCAR. And, and uh, you can visit us SIBS on stand 82. And that's something you just can't do from your bedroom. So um, uh, definitely worthwhile checking out in 2021. So now I would like to uh, introduce the first of our three experts um, who are going to talk uh, about air tightness in buildings. Um, and before I introduce um, the first one, uh, Sean Maxwell, I just want to talk about the importance of this. Um, if you think about it, and I, uh, when I was talking about this in our last uh, seminar about uh, a month ago, we talked about the, the uh, journey that we've been on in Australia around energy efficiency, where um, we've made some great progress in terms of improving HVAC systems, um, and, we, and that's resulted in um, um, some uh, very high neighbors ratings. Um, but now, a lot, as I mentioned the last time, there have been a lot of the um, large property owners in Australia have set clients around zero carbon targets. And um, uh, that includes uh, a lot of the property funds and a lot of the large universities like University of Melbourne, or um, University of uh, uh, Monash and various others, they've all set zero carbon targets. And in order to uh, meet those targets, what we really have to address is the things that we haven't been so good in the industry at doing, which is um, designing and delivering low, in, uh, low, um, uh, low energy, well insulated airtight buildings. And the great thing about um, where we are at the moment is that there is a real need to, in order to meet the uh, zero carbon targets, to tackle those issues that we haven't been good at. And the good news for us is that over the last five or six years, there's been a real um, uh, a build up of expertise in the issues of uh, insulation and air tightness. And over the next while, we're going to start seeing um, quite a number of uh, world-class, well-insulated airtight buildings meeting the passive house standards. But it's not that every building has to go and meet a passive house standards. What, but what we do have to do is get a lot better at, um, as HVAC engineers, as, as SIBS members, at designing buildings which, uh, as a matter of course, need to um, be able to go and deliver insulation and air tightness. And uh, as I've mentioned, we've uh, assembled a panel of um, the best uh, people in the industry to go and talk about uh, the issues of insulation and, and air tightness. 
And the first person I'd like to introduce is, is Sean Maxwell. And Sean is technical manager with ProClima Australia, a manufacturer of high performance building membranes and seals. And he's also the Australian and New Zealand scheme manager for ATMA, an air tightness uh, testing and measurement association. And I've known uh, Sean for about five years and uh, it's absolutely true that his driving passion is the organization and elevation of Australian and New Zealand's community of building diagnostic uh, professionals. And uh, so I'm gonna hand over to Sean and um, he's going to give you some background to why um, air tightness testing is important and uh, some information on, on, on ATMA. So thanks very much, Sean, and over to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's been a real uh, privilege to get to know you over the past five years, actually. So um, thanks for the opportunity. So uh, just make sure, let me know if you can, if you can't see my screen. Um, Hope you can. All right, you're okay. Good. Okay, so uh, I'm Sean Waxwell. I work with um, ProClima, uh, which sells membranes and tapes and things like that to seal buildings, make them airtight. But um, I'm also working now, uh, really excited to be working with um, the Airtightness Testing and Measurement Association, which is a, a worldwide um, association of airtightness testers. This is all we think about um, is how to do airtightness uh, testing properly and repeatedly and make this into a really uh, professional pursuit. So um, anything about air tightness, um, well, uh, we three here are, are pretty good good resources and we're always very welcome to share our, uh, our thoughts. So uh, you can reach me at either of these email addresses. Um, so uh, one quick plug for something that, so I've actually worked with uh, John and Joseph over the past few years, pretty much since I got here actually. Um, <laughs> on air tightness things. One thing we did uh, just recently is make some great short YouTube videos on uh, the basics of air tightness. And I really encourage you to uh, give them a look. You can go there on this, this link at our website, aivaa.asn.au. And uh, these are quick and simple, but I think very often overlooked um, matters of building air tightness. So, not just uh, understanding what it is, but how to design for a better building seal and then how to actually build it. So uh, I think they're pretty worth worth sharing. Okay, so just some basics about air tightness. I'm gonna set uh, a few things uh, out for our conversation here. Um, one is um, just about blower door numbers that you might hear because uh, some of you on this call might've seen blower door specifications or air tightness specifications for your project but don't really know what they mean or um, picked some language from another project uh, that you uh, saw and uh, maybe you need uh, a little more info about what these things actually refer to. Two blower door numbers that you often uh, hear are <coughs> permeability and air changes per hour. They're really the same thing or two ways of expressing the same thing, which is air leakage from the building. And it's either air leakage per unit of surface area or air leakage per unit of volume. And it's just a means of comparing one building to another. So um, my blower door number uh, might mean uh, less than uh, your blower door number if uh, you have a much bigger building and you still get the same result. Uh, that means you've, uh, by comparison, done a better job. So the two numbers, the difference is um, for houses, it's actually pretty convenient that houses have a pretty similar surface area and volume. So the two numbers permeability and air changes per hour are actually pretty similar. Um, but uh, what you'll hear sometimes is, is ACH or ACH50. Um, that's air leakage per unit of volume. And so I just put these pictures in here to give you some sense of what I'm talking about. Um, when I say surface area uh, of one of these buildings, I'm talking about the surface area of the walls, the floor and the ceiling of this uh, box or building. So for a house that includes the floor slab for a building that includes the floors and it also includes the walls and the ceiling, uh, the con entire conditioned envelope. So um, 
that's some basic terms there, ACH and permeability. The thing is that for talking with a lot of people, say homeowners, for example, talking about air changes per hour is a little easier to relate to everyday uh, people who don't need to know much about this. It's a good thing that permeability and air changes per hour are pretty similar because uh, with air changes per hour, it's a little easier to relate to someone. If you said in this room, all the air is going to leave one time in one hour, that's one air change per hour. And people can sort of get that. But if you said, all right, let me visualize one cubic meter per hour of air leakage going through every square meter of envelope area, this uh, enclosure here, just a little, not, not that easy to relate to. So um, it's convenient that for um, houses, they're pretty similar. So um, one thing that we want to talk about when we're uh, doing a blower door test, we're talking about the whole building as a system. So the building envelope in this picture from uh, US government, um, building envelope is this red box here um, in this graphic. So uh, whose leak is the problem here? Um, we're thinking about the building as a system. Well, uh, there are many, many, many leaks that factor into the air leakage equation here. So um, that includes things like not just the walls, the ceilings, the floors, the things you would buy Proclima membranes for, but lots of other things that we don't sell, like windows, doors, plumbing penetrations, uh, electrical penetrations, um, HVAC, and then uh, all of the uh, transitions and joints between, say, conditioned spaces and unconditioned spaces. So it's actually quite a complex system. So um, Whose responsibility is uh, air tightness? Well, you, you, uh, if we took a poll here, maybe some of you would uh, say it's this, this person's fault uh, that the building is leaky. It's actually probably some of everyone's fault uh, that it's leaky. But it's really uh, the, the success uh, starts with the designer who makes a good specification and good set of drawings to show how to actually achieve air tightness. And this is especially important for commercial buildings uh, to get some pretty uh, good conceptual uh, definition of where the air barrier is in the building. Uh, but ultimately, it's actually the builder's job uh, to uh, conduct this whole symphony of uh, separate trades that are all, they all have something to do with the air tightness uh, for any, any building. And really, they need to coordinate the efforts. And if someone messes something up, they need to make sure that it's fixed and uh, need to manage the sequence of doing things. It's the builder that is conducting this whole air tightness symphony. So um, air tightness testing sits within uh, a commissioning process. So unfortunately, uh, air tightness is often, air tightness commissioning is often left to the occupancy phase of commissioning. So these are all stages in the commissioning process, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, from pre-design phase all the way to construction and then verification phase. Occupancy phase is sometimes the builder, or the, the homeowner moves in and then says, oh, actually this is a, a picture from a building near, near Sydney, which had massive, massive condensation problems because not enough ventilation, too airtight, no ventilation, and uh, just uh, massive problems because they had a very poor building envelope. That's not the kind of commissioning you want. So um, the cost to change that failure at that point in construction is incredibly expensive. And your options, your ability to do any changes are very, very few. So that's not the situation you want. You want to, your gains will be made much better in the early uh, phases of construction. So the blower door test is really done at the very end of the project. That's where if you've done a good job, all it is, it amounts to a good pat on the back to say, good job, we really did this well. That's what a blower door test at the end is. And it's a quantitative test. It's a number that you can then uh, report to ATMA, uh, to the database that ATMA runs. There are other tests and uh, steps you can do. So qualitative techniques like smoke tests and things like that can be done early on project to help you find failures, but they're not really the same as the number that you get from a quantitative test at the end of the project. And really the, the biggest gains in terms of performance are gonna come from the earlier phases of construction. So pre-design phase, design development phase. So the pen test, schematic design would help you with space definition and 
uh, different treatment strategies for uh, the different zones. And then pre-design phase, it's some big picture questions like, what are we gonna build out of? Is it gonna be precast concrete? Well, you're gonna have fairly airtight uh, construction. Is it going to be stick frame, uh, timber frame? You have different challenges. Those are conceptual things before the building's even drawn. Uh, that's the pre-design phase. And when you make changes at that stage, you can make some big gains early on. So uh, just to drive home a little bit more about the difference between qualitative and quantitative testing, qualitative techniques are things like smoke tests, water leakage tests under pressure, infrared imaging, things like that. They really uh, help you find problems with the building, but they're not a number that you can use for comparison to other buildings. Uh, to gauge how well you've done. So a whole building test where you do the whole building at one time, the building as a system, as I showed before in that uh, picture of the house, all those things are assessed at the same time under a single pressure. That's the goal of testing through um, ISO 9972, which is the Australian uh, air tightness standard and by the ATMA uh, technical standard guidelines. So uh, those, those are really the gold standard, the only type that you can compare the numbers between. So qualitative techniques still can be useful. Here's a, a roof uh, assembly, which I was, uh, once you do this long enough, you know what's gonna leak before you even <laughs> show someone else. Uh, so uh, this is a roof parapet, a uh, roof uh, wall junction, which is usually the a total failure point in pretty much any co commercial building in Australia, gotta say. Uh, so here I am at the outside during a blower door test with a fog machine and you can see a fog coming out of, you can see fog coming out of the uh, HVAC and even the light fixtures. This, I'm spraying fog at this roof uh, junction here and it's coming out of the lights inside. That's not supposed to happen. So. Uh, it's pretty interesting when you have the blower door running and you're getting this, this number that you, the quantitative number, you can use these diagnostic tools as well to help you find leaks. But it, so is that sort of testing useful or those techniques, are those useful information? Yeah, of course it is. But is it a number uh, that you can use for comparison or trust? Uh, no, it's not. Um, but uh, should you be able to then use the qualitative techniques like smoke tests and infrared to be able to demonstrate compliance with a regulate regulation or a specification? No, like I said, they're still useful, but it's not really a regulatory tool. Um, and so they're useful, but not uh, quite, they're not at all uh, proof of compliance with a, a standard. So that's where it's actually a problem in our industry in Australia right now where tests like this are being posed as uh, good enough to demonstrate you've done your job. Uh, absolutely not, not good enough. So unfortunately, uh, uh, sometimes I get these questions about uh, from clients that want to do a, a test for Green Star. They ask, uh, well, um, how do I do the test? And I say, well, what, what do you want from this? Do you just want to get the Green Star points or do you want to actually get a better building? Because uh, believe it or not, that's not always the same thing. Um, so if you just want the green star points, you're gonna specify the minimum test size, like what's the absolute minimum I can do? What's the lowest cost? You're gonna do the least thing, just get the credit and then walk away. Um, or you, if you actually want to get a better building, you do a whole building test, which is the only way to really view the system build, building as a whole. Uh, you could set an easy air tightness target of green star has 20 cubic meters per hour, uh, per square meter, which they, uh, is sort of a, a useless number actually uh, for regulation. Um, or you could actually set a respectable design air permeability. If you fail to reach that design air permeability of say five cubic meters per hour per square meter, then you fail and you can learn from that, but uh, at least set something that is a real number. Um, and then if you're just going for the green star points, you might get the credit, do the test, and then walk away, job done, mission accomplished, got the credit. Uh, but if you want to get a better building, you could review the results of the test, look at uh, the these uh, pictures and videos that testers love to take of all the failures. They would love to tell you more about uh, how you can do better next time. 
So the way we currently do things uh, for code compliance uh, verification in Australia is we have a visual inspection of things. So uh, NCC volume two, uh, part 3.12.3 has uh, a very loose creative checklist of things that you need to, uh, to do to seal your building. But really uh, compliance with that is just an opinion about whether something is close fitting or, or not, or whether it's uh, sealable or not sealable. So it, the end result is that building ceiling is ignored. So is it actually working? Well, if you just look at the data from CSIRO, for example, no, it's not working. The Australian average is 15.4 air changes per hour per square meter, 15.4 uh, air changes per hour uh, out of 125 plus homes that they did um, a few years ago. That's bad. Just some numbers for comparison. Florida, US state code, one of the least stringent in the US, seven air changes per hour. So that's uh, twice as tight as that. Um, that's the code, that's the worst you can do and still get your certificate of occupancy. That's the worst. In New York, my home state, three air changes per hour is the code. Unless you get uh, five times tighter than the Australian average, you're not gonna get your certif certificate of occupancy. Passive house, by comparison, 0 0.6 air changes per hour. So we have a long way to go. And I guess we could put it in a very positive way. There's so many energy savings on this energy savings tree that we can just pluck and uh, they'll be so juicy and cheap energy savings that we're gonna love here. So much opportunity for improvement. So what the NCC did in 2019 is put uh, 10 cubic meters per hour per square meter permeability um, as the maximum if you want to use the uh, uh, verification pathway of just doing a blower door test to show that you've uh, complied with this requirement to seal your building. So the cool thing about, uh, there's many good reasons for the testing approach. Um, one is it's repeatable. Uh, I can do the test, John can do the test, Joseph can get the test, and we will pretty uh, confidently get very, very close numbers. So it's not an opinion. It's not like if I decide if something's been well sealed or not, it's actually not up to me. It's up to the computer um, and the uh, calculations, whether you did the job well or not. The other good thing is that builders have freedom to uh, do use different means to get to that number that they need to meet. And testing itself, when you do a blower door test, it puts pressure on the building and that gives real time feedback to the testers about which things are leaking and which things are not. So it's a pretty powerful uh, learning tool. And for policymakers, it's also really powerful because those uh, numbers can be adjusted over time. The stringency can be dialed up and dialed down, which you can't really do with an opinion-based uh, verification strategy. So one thing I like to think about here is um, air tightness results. So this data is from Atma Lodgement. So you'd say, if you look at the numbers, you'd say uh, the peaks, these are results, this is a histogram of, of test results. So if you look at the, the biggest one there, between 4.9 and 5.0 cubic meters per hour per square meter, most of the test results come in right under the threshold of five. So what that tells you is that the builders are just getting under uh, the threshold of five. The way it works in the building code there is you have to declare what you're gonna get and then you have to do the test to prove that you got there. So uh, it sort of makes sense that uh, you'd be getting just underneath what you, if you set the limit of five, you'd be getting right under there. And uh, some would look at that and say, geez, doesn't this prove that builders are so lazy? They only do uh, just what they need to do. Well, I actually look at that and I say, this shows exactly what we wanted to show, which is the builders, they are doing exactly what the, you tell them to do. They pr doing exactly what they've promised they would do. Uh, to me, this looks like a market mechanism of uh, regulation actually working. Uh, they're becoming very efficient at delivering the thing that they said they were gonna deliver at a minimum cost. So to me, it shows innovation and uh, the market actually working. So I think it's very powerful for that reason. So how this works in the real world at my, um, the process is becoming more and more automated all the time. The lodgement system has, has uh, 
the blower door software can upload these results to the Atma Lodgement database, which is anonymous and secure. And uh, this certificate on the right here is um, a registered, registered air tightness test certificate. So the way it would work in the real world is uh, the building code sets a maximum leakage rate and you do the, uh, the tester does the test and then they show the certifier or the surveyor the test result and it, it has on it whether it passes or fails. And that's pretty, that uh, makes it uh, an easy job for the certifier to, to tell whether it's been done or not. So Atma then serves as an impartial intermediary between the regulators, the builders and the regulator, uh, which is the building code um, bodies. So um, it's a pretty, uh, pretty useful uh, synergy. So um, one thing I just want you to, to see is that uh, Atma as an industry, the air tightness testing industry is growing all the time. So there's actually a course next week for uh, more testers to join the industry. This is generating jobs. It's also generating um, a way to educate builders on how to do things better. And it's also providing regulators a way to start getting a handle on something that's been out of reach so far. So the uh, Atma Lodgement database now has 770,000 lodgements as of yesterday, and it's growing all the time. So it's pretty, pretty amazing tool. And uh, we're glad that we're, we're here in Australia using it now. So um, that's what I would like to, uh, to talk about. So here's my information and I will um, stop sharing. Okay. All right, well, this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Sean. That was uh, wonderful. One of the things that I think you, um, you didn't actually mention on this thing, but you might cover later on is that, you know, we've been very lucky in that, um, you know, you and a number of other pioneers about five or six years ago brought Atma to Australia. And one of the things that uh, kind of didn't mention the fact is that the reason that the 770,000 is that they, Atma has been, how long has it been in the UK? How long has it been going for? Well, the, the association itself is um, 12 or 13 years old, but Atma Lodgement has been going on for um, almost five years. And so, what ends up happening is that once uh, you know uh, John and Joseph do their their tests, um, it's the information is loaded up from the um, uh, you know you all use common software, common fans, etc. And so there's a lot of validation around that, and that it's been proved uh, because we're tapping into in Australia resources that have been that database and the validation systems that have been put in. There's no question about having some kind of a, a pink bat scenario. You've actually, we've tapped into world-class uh, testing and the, you know, the folk who are doing the testing like, um, like uh, John and Joseph are actually meeting world-class standards, not some um, standard that we're working on in Australia. It's actually, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's the best in the world for doing that. Is that correct? That's absolutely right, Jeff. Absolutely. And if I, if I ever moved back to America, I'd be uh, trying to convert uh, all 100,000 testers over there to Atma members as well. <laughs> well, look, there's going to be lots of conversations later on, um, but I now have to, uh, I'm going to introduce our, our next two experts. So um, I'm going to introduce John Kay, and he is the Managing Director and Principal Consultant of Efficiency Matrix. Um, one of the leading uh, building air tightness testing companies in Victoria. He has, he's a legend in the industry. He has completed uh, many whole building, uh, commercial building air tightness blower tests in Australia uh, and has consulted with many buildings, uh, builders to achieve buildings with um, uh, airtight uh, states lower than five meters cubed per hour per square meters of 50 pascals. His relationship with builders over the years has earned him repeat business uh, from all of the large construction companies operating in Australia. And um, I mean, he's pretty famous in the air tightness testing, but what you may not realize is he is also a YouTube star. That's not often you see, I mean, we see TikTok, we see a whole lot of people, but John is well known as probably the most exposed person in the um, uh, building construction industry. 
and he has a series called eco uh, ecoevo.com.au um, or you can just type in in YouTube um, uh, 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 efficiency matrix and you will see I mean I think I sat down and watched them um, prior to uh, being interviewed myself after about three and a half hours of going through the videos I'd only touch the uh, the surface so everything you ever want to know about air tightness is there and I strongly recommend that you uh, tap into whether it's commercial buildings or residential buildings. Uh, John's made a video about it. So John, thank you very much for, for introducing that, uh, for, uh, for all the work you do and um, sharing that information. The other person I'm gonna introduce is a, a friend from the industry from a very, very long time uh, back, um, right from when he was in um, working uh, with Mark Luther in, in Deakin University and worked with me for some time. Uh, Joseph Chung, he's a, a technical director and a principal consultant uh, with Efficiency Matrix. Uh, he has a vast amount of experience and knowledge in building performance. He's an architect, Green Star accredited professional, and a Natters assessor. He specializes in modeling uh, building performance, duct systems, risers, exhaust systems, and whole building performance with regard to air tightness and the insulation uh, consistency. Um, and he truly is the everything you ever wanted to ask about air tightness testing, but we're afraid to ask. So I'm going to hand over to um, both you and uh, Joseph. Actually, one thing I do want to ask is a question which you might pick up in your presentation. But can you tell us what an ATMA Level 2 certified person is? Because you're both uh, ATMA Level 2 certified. Anyway, uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, John and Joseph who are going to talk about um, air tightness and building services uh, testing and everything you ever need to know about that. Thank you. I'm, uh, can everyone hear me, hear us? Beautifully. I'm gonna let uh, Joseph run the show mostly here, but level two, and a level two air tightness tester is someone who can test commercial buildings, um, but not to test commercial buildings with a HVAC system itself. So the next step up is a level three, and uh, and then yeah, with, with that certification, you can um, basically use a HVAC system, which is still uh, from 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 what we've heard out there, using a HVAC system to pressure test a building gives you unreproducible results. <laughs> so, on that, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, Joseph. Um, I'm not going to elaborate. On that, but Let's put it simple, this easiest differentiation between level one and level two. Level one can only do a single fan test with limited size building. In level two, we can do multi-fan, large scale building. That's the easiest thing you need to remember. As a professional, you need to find someone to do the test and looking at the test reports. All right. Okay. First come first, I know that today we are mostly talking to building services engineers and just a very, very brief why it um, related to you because air leakage can affect the energy efficiency of all the building services performance. And the first impact is very obvious, the direct infiltration, exfiltration loss because of the air moving in and out from the ambient but it also will affect the air distribution effectiveness, especially the unpredictable nature caused by wind. Sometimes the wind coming from the north side and you find it hard to push your conditioned air into the north zone, but half an hour later, the wind direction change and it messes up your um, control system. Not just that it also caused um, periodic imbalance caused by wind, I just expected that, um, explained that, but something may be a bit more concerning, especially for, um, for some of you that is also in the commissioning game. Um, it's how it affects the performance of the stair pressurization system. Because if you've got a leaky building, the wind, the interaction would make it to a some extent quite unpredictable. The relief air path 
where the um, stair pressurization system need to tackle off. So it's not just about energy efficiency, comfort, and it also, the other thing is, when we do um, air tightness tests, we can also at the same time testing the smoke compartment, whether they actually containing the smoke in one zone or not. So let's move on to the next slide. Designing for air tightness, to be honest, the majority of the air barrier is mainly dictated by the architects and the structural engineers depends on what kind of facade, wall and structural system they use. They can make wise choice, make the life easier for the builder or put them into hell. However, today I'm only going to cover the area where the mechanical and electrical engineer have influences on. And number one is the zoning. Not just about how your heating and cooling zones are, but sometimes in the early design stage, conceptual design stage, you need to include some considerations and discuss that with the architects and also potentially the building surveyor. Some key examples are lift lobbies in the car park. In the past, a lot of the time we try to save cost, value management, get rid of the smoke, uh, the smoke lobby or the lift lobby in the car park floor. But if you have to do a air leakage test, that can be a point that um, hold you back a lot. Imagine most of the lift door that we have don't really have a seal and it's really hard yep. to make it effective in installing seals into the lift door. So practically you are letting a 15 to 20 mil gap all around the lift door for every single lift going to the car park on every single car park floor it adds up quite quickly. And the second thing is loading zone. Talk to the architects to see how can you separate the loading zone from the condition space. Where is the most sensible area you can put a door that is also sealed? How to lay air barrier around the loading zone so it's going to work. One thing that we are going to promote one of our video as well is not all building material system are airtight. One thing that we keep coming back to us every time we talk to the builder, oh, we got core field concrete block wall, but try to do a search on our websites to watch that video on how leaky the block works are. You will be extremely surprised how the smoke just filters through core field block works. Next thing is even more problematic is the commercial kitchens. You need to provide exhaust, make up air, and to make matter worse, the exhaust of the commercial kitchen, you virtually can't put damper to control it after hours because of the grease, the potential for fire. Always try to consider what is the alternative to exclude that or to make that independent zone with its own air barrier and air conditioning. And the other thing is risers. We all deal with risers as a mechanical or electrical engineers. Whether the risers should be inside or outside the air barrier would make it very, very different. You either create a capping between the plant room floors or between the top roof to try to create the air barrier um, at a smaller area. Like you, if you can see my mouse cursor, you can either provide a capping on the top and at the bottom of your riser. So you minimize the area you need to treat as airtight. But at the same time, if for some reason you cannot do that, maybe because of the density of surfaces inside make it virtually impossible to seal that, then you need to be very, very careful in the detailing and design of the penetration on every single floor to maintain the integrity. There's always some kind of trade-off. So 
if you do those, if you make those decisions early on, especially if you try to cap off the riser, you need to somehow coordinate the duct work, the cable tray, so they can have a flat surface or end it at the same level. You can easily put a flashing on to seal it off instead of trying to slot in a, a, a piece of um, sheet metal here, a piece of sheet metal there and try to seal it, which is virtually never going to work if you try to do it up as an afterthought. Next. Um, this is a diagram showing how we define air barrier. Sean already gone through that, but we just quickly go through is where the barrier, it is the separation between condition and unconditioned space as well as condition space and outdoor area. Your suspended ceiling should never be considered as the air barrier. Your raised floor should not be considered as your air barrier. So we can move on. Okay, designed for air tightness from a services engineer's perspective. Always try to consolidate the penetration through the air barriers, whether it is external walls or risers, try to put them into a more consolidated location, but not overly packing them. That makes it a lot easier to do QA and ensure all the penetration are properly sealed off. And the other is extremely important is how you detail those penetration. First rule is always consider um, to leave enough clearance. Very commonly we can see like this one, the duct is abutted to the surface of the concrete slab. Once you install it like that, you cannot go back to seal the top of the duct work. If the duct is really small, less than three or 400 mil wide, potentially you can still use expander foam or put um, extended tube to put caulking on to seal it. But for common size 600 plus wide duct work, virtually is impossible. So what can you do? You either lower the duct work. If headroom is a real problem, then you may need to pre-install some kind of gasket under the sofa for the ducts to go through. Then you push up the duct to create a seal. And then the remaining three sides, you can use conventional method. And the other example at the bottom, we have three duct work. And you can see the builder or the contractor seal the bottom and the side with caulking, but he cannot get to the top. This is a very common um, occurrence when we do inspections. The other thing is cables, when they're in a bundle, is very hard to seal. And sometimes, even though you think you seal that, the contractor thought they sealed that, but a little bit of movement would just tear the seal off. So how we detail that is very, very critical. And, it, and the other item that I want to emphasize is fire pillows are not airtight. They stop fire, but they don't stop smoke or air moving through. And always try to allow access, accessibility for quality assurance later. Not just thinking about how they install, but after they install, how can the builder, the air tightness consultant go in to check if they are still in good condition before they are being closed up to try to get the last chance to fix issue like this cable penetration if any accident happen. And then what other thing we need to consider is if you have pressurized the builder shaft as your supply or return air path, make sure you establish a regime for quality assurance, especially the um, walls that will be encased inside the riser. Those are very easily to be overlooked and is very, very, very difficult and expensive if you try to rectify that. The other areas are like AHU, ductwork and damper. We always see them have a leakage allowance in the specification, but how often 
do you see test report on the air handling unit and the dampers? Very, very rare. But because of the requirement on the empirical testing of the building, I think all of you should start asking for the test report on the air handling unit and the dampers. Plus, get the contractor to do more um, percentage of ductwork, not just a 5% test or just two run tests. Try to test as close to 100% of the ductwork as possible. The other is smoke spill, stair pressurization relief path. Because sometimes when we see um, some of those pressure relief um, um, dampers in the seating space connecting to the facade, some of them only got blutified dampers, which got a 10 mil gaps all around it, leaking air in and out day and night, which is totally unacceptable. Okay, more, these are not, um, these are some suggestions that would make um, life easier and easier to achieve a better um, test result. When the commissioning agents commissioning the dampers, make sure they put extra force into the actuator. Sometimes it's quite often, we visually check the dampers look nicely shut, but as soon as we start the fan, they got turned slightly open, which may not look like much, but imagine in a building, you got 36 air handler, each blade of the damper have a three mil gap. It adds up to a pretty big hole quite quickly. The other is for us, I know that um, safe SS, OHNS is getting bigger and bigger each day. Please, when you're designing your system, not only consider for the um, maintenance um, facility manager, but also us to have safe access so we can do the blanking temporary sealing of ductwork, inlet or outlet in, on, on the roof or on the facade um, with a safe passage. And also if the building is not designed to be operating 24 seven, it is a good idea to include motorized damper to the toilet exhaust to stop unwanted air exchange after hour, to overly pre-cool the building in winter, for example. That's huge. Yep. And then when you're designing the system, try to provide some kind of access panel or some um, space so we can potentially spay the ductwork inside the plant room instead of need to jump onto a gondola to seal that work um, on the facade. Okay, next is um, that's about the design and now we go to more the construction phase, um, quality assurance or preliminary testing. We love to call that the prototype testing because we try to do this type of testing as early as possible. Um, for example, for curtain wall system, we always advise the builder to get us in after you completed like a 10 meter, 15 meter section of your first floor of curtain wall. So we can verify the on-site procedure, how they get put together is good enough to match the lab test they did in the factory. Mm -hmm. What are the common system or common method that we can offer or we can use our ultrasonic testing, they are extremely effective for system like curtain wall, doors, windows, but it's not as effective in um, multi-layer construction like um, timber or uh, metal stud wall constructions. The other method is if there is some kind of enclosure that can be created, we can then pressurize that room or that floor and then do thermal imaging or smoke testing to try to identify where are the weak points to try to confirm the ceiling um, specification in the um, cable tray or duct penetrations are good enough. Or the other thing is you can 
also get an experience air tester because when we do testing, we always do troubleshooting. We virtually know where can go wrong and a visual inspection can be very, very effective. But one thing as Sean mentioned, doing a compartment, especially small compartment testing is not equivalent. It cannot give you a numerical result that can represent your building's real performance. Yeah. Okay. okay, next. Here is some example of um, component testing. We can do um, testing a large smoke spill damper. And when we pressurize the damper, you can see some of the edges opening up slightly. And when we do smoke testing or water testing, we can identify where are the weak point that um, smoke comes through. But if you are not using some future rooms or partitions to do that test, it can get quite expensive to create temporary structure to enclose part of the facade to do that test. Alternatively, you can create a mock-up with um, the type of material that is proposed and try to fit in as many junctions that would be used in your building and then smoke test that little mock-up room. And this is a lot more practical, small scale can be done even before the um, tender stage to test the concept of certain um, um, connection junction details. And then whole building test. Mm -hmm. We we quite often hearing feedback say, oh, we cannot test the whole building, the building is too big, um, it's too hard to do, but we can share with you in, in the past two weeks, we tested two decent sized commercial building. One of them is a 73,000 meter square GA, 128 meter tall office building in Melbourne. The other is an 11 story heritage, partially heritage upgrade, partially new build, 21,000 meter square GFA building with a huge atrium. Those are buildings that a lot of people we think is too hard to test, but it is all doable. And also the builder of the heritage building, they were so anxious about the result they get us to do a partial compartment test of the building and get a certain result. And at the end, after we do the whole building test, we find out by doing a whole building test is 35% better, the result. So if you approach a air tightness tester, always try to do the whole building test. Otherwise you will be handicapped by the testing method that you choose. Yeah. And what actually will limit the size of a building that can be tested is listed on the screen here. Number one, leakage target. It is, it is very, very different to test a huge building with a target of 20 meter cube per hour per meter square, allowable leakage like what is in the Green Star or testing a passive house. To test a building as big as the Rialto Tower, if it meets the requirement of passive house, is no harder than testing a aquatic center with a 20 meter cube per hour per meter square um, leakage target because of the ratio of the surface area to the leakage. And that's the first thing that we keep advising most of the client that come to us really early in the um, design um, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the design phase of the project. You can either be lazy and do a architectural structural de detailed design with no concern about the air leakage and have a target of 20 meter cube. If you have that, the price for testing that building would be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range. Or you can spend half of that budget to detail, to design the building envelope properly. And you only need to spend 20, $30,000 to do the test. 
it's up to you to spend a lot of money to do a test that deliver a poor building or spend the money into a good building and only spend a little bit on testing. Yep. Mm. Okay. Okay. And then the last bit is just sharing some experience of what Sean did cover. Yeah. This is two doors. If we only looking at word by word interpretation, these doors are comply with the deem to satisfy provision in the building code because these doors, even though you can see daylight through them, the gaps, they restricted the air flow through it compared to a door with no seal at all. It still reduced the air leakage fluid, but would you consider that a tight component, a door? No. But if you ask a solicitor, they can interpret that as a compliance. And that's why we should always test a building, even though now it's still a voluntary measure. I think that's about it, yep. isn't it? Yep, it is yes. a similar thing. So, um, Time for questions. Yeah, it's question time. So I'm going to stop sharing here, guys. That's great. I hope that was entertaining. John and Joseph, thanks very, very much. That was an excellent presentation. So um, um, we're now going to go into a Q&A session. Um, and uh, look, I'll, I'll start off the batting by just saying, look, can you just give us, I mean, you guys have been, maybe, maybe you could actually all just give us a little bit of a, how the heck did you get into something like air tightness testing? And, and uh, just a little bit about your thoughts on where is the industry at the moment? And, and what I mean by that is, you know, what's the level of knowledge amongst um, uh, designers, whether that's maybe HVAC designers, uh, architects and so on, and builders about actually designing for and then building for air tightness? And do you think there is perhaps some opportunity to improve? So maybe a little bit of how you got in and then okay. uh, Data play I'll, I'll start off to how, how we got in. Well, I, I got into air tightness testing um, from, I, originally I was from the IT industry and um, I started producing products to improve the performance and air tightness and then realized that um, we need some way to test whether something is more airtight or, or, or less airtight and uh, got into that and then started testing underfloor plenums and, and houses, but there wasn't much house air tightness testing at that stage. And then from there, I just went on a crusade to try and build up as much fan capacity to test the largest buildings in the country. And then, um, and then that's about it. <laughs> what about your journey, uh, Joseph? Well, for me, it's slightly different. Um, <laughs> Early on in my career, I started from the post occupancy evaluation of buildings. And then I move in to work with you as a consulting, always trying to design energy efficient building. Everything looks good on paper in the design in the simulation model. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about delivery and the actual building being used by the occupants, they varies a fair bit. And a lot of the blame got put back on to the consulting engineers, which I feel extremely unfair. And I was in the quest to find out why. <laughs> and one of the very significant reason why the predicted performance doesn't match the actual is the air leakage. Whether they are in the duct work or in the building envelope, it doesn't matter, but they are very big part of why we missed the target. That's how I get into this. And I know that unless we get this one fixed or improve, the, the industry can't go much further. Sean, tell me about how, you, how did you end up in Australia and why are you head of that? Uh, I ended up in Australia because of a girl. Oh, I know that's good. <laughs> uh, but then, um, <clears throat> 
<clears throat> I got uh, out of college. My first uh, test out of college was uh, doing blower door testing. So I've done, uh, yeah, over a thousand blower door tests, I'm sure. Um, and then the way I got interested in Atma is I just have this uh, obsession with gathering the data to tell the truth about what's actually going on. So um, Atma welcomed me with open arms and said, I said, can I join? And they said, absolutely. Yes, you can use our database. And they've been extremely uh, welcoming and want to uh, spread this practice uh, for to make the world a better place. So I really found some uh, real allies in them. So uh, they want to help us use this database, uh, customize it for Australia and for New Zealand, and uh, expand uh, standard practice so that it's uh, lifted up, uh, help improve the quality across across the world. So I'm really excited to be with that. And it's interesting, one of the things I would say about Atma is uh, having met the chap who runs it, who's uh, kind to come over to Australia a few different times. He was saying in one of his presentations that the database is one of the most extensive databases of buildings in in the UK. And actually, the I think the um, UK government has actually gone to Atma to go and get information on some of the building stock because it's got one of the best building databases around. Is that right? That's what I've heard, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. So can I just ask the question of the three of you again? Your, your thoughts on where the industry is at the moment? I mean, are we, are we knocking out of the park in terms of air tightness or is there a long way to go? Well, I, I think it's, it's both at the same time. From the designer and consultant's point of view, the, the speed that they're gaining the knowledge and experience is um, very, very promising. They are moving so fast and thanks to Green Star and all everyone here that help educating and pushing the um, designers and the consultants but um, somehow I see one of the major um, stumbling block that we are facing is the mismatch of the knowledge of the designer and the skill set of the trade that actually deliver. Because for most of the designer and consultant, we um, get our knowledge on air barrier from Europe, from the US, where their construction technique is substantially different from how we build here. And a lot of the material system that they use over there, when they apply to the Australian way of construction, needs a lot of adoption. And the skill set of the tray is not um, catching up to a lot of the um, design detail that the team put to the builder. Yep. Well, one of the very obvious examples is um, building membrane wraps is very, very common occurrence in Europe and in the US. But in here, the skills of the trade to apply that is um, still a long way to go. And it's getting to a point that for, at least for myself, if a project is aiming to get a very, very high um, air tightness target, or, or I should say a very low number, very ambitious target, I would advise them to use um, um, sheeting base air barrier instead of membrane because the tray are more custom, they feel more comfortable to deal with material similar to cementious and plasterboard, they know they feel comfortable to build, deal with that. But having said that, it takes time to transfer the skill and the awareness to more um, the foreman and the actual trade that doing the job. So Sean, one of the things that you spoke about in your presentation was, I mean, you pointed out a kind of a, a detail, a roof detail, and you said, look, typically, this is just terrible and, and it's an issue. Could you just talk about not that particular detail, but the challenges in the construction industry of what is custom and practice and your thoughts on what do we have to do? Do we have to change systems? 
we have to change the detailing. How do, how do we move from air tightness being the exception to air tightness being business, uh, airtight buildings being business as usual? And they're not, not paying any premium because that's just we've learned how to do it better. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely echo uh, Joseph's comments about, um, it's impressive that uh, we, uh, as, as, well, as Australia as a country is uh, learning all the time and there are really, really excellent buildings being built right now. So it's not that it's not possible, it's, being, it's happening all the time. It's pretty amazing. Um, and it doesn't actually take much training to take a basic builder and make them into a really good builder. Um, and it also doesn't take that many um, expensive products to take um, a, a bad building and to make it into a pretty good building. So that's, for me, that's really encouraging because one of my uh, personal quests is to um, find this pathway to net zero energy construction. And for houses, um, that means getting to a reasonable level of air tightness at very low cost. And I think that's absolutely possible. There's no excuse not to be doing that on the building code um, in this country. It's not that, not that far. Um, so for commercial buildings, um, uh, the biggest gains are definitely going to be made with uh, first with better details. There's, I have so many pictures of uh, really good uh, wall um, insulation panels uh, and a really good roof insulation panel and they make a parapet, but then there's actually no connection specified between them. Mm -hmm. And so the air just goes right through that gap. Like uh, it's amazing. Um, it's not a surprise. If you looked at the plans, you'd say, hmm, it looks like you could crawl through there. And then definitely, definitely you can crawl through there. So um, some of this is, is just some basic uh, design, designer education. That's gonna be, make the biggest gains. And then from there, uh, it'll be um, getting builders uh, to uh, pay attention to these details and, and do things in the right way. But I think the biggest gains are going to be made from design for sure. Yeah. Well, look, uh, I'm going to ask a few of the questions that have been coming through. Um, uh, so um, Alan Van Brown asked the question, so is it safe to say that a successful air tightness test is one where the designer and the builder are careful with the detailing? That's for sure. And, and one of the foremen must be, have the eye to the detail. It's always the little detail here and there, one millimeter there, one millimeter there, that adds up a big hole. That's right. And um, can I ask you a question? Another one is, this is from Fred Brown. And uh, Fred asks, uh, do you find that the air tightness performance of building deteriorates over time? And is it a significant deterioration it can be it can be it it really comes back to the design of the air barrier and the appropriate material being used one of the most shocking example that we had was the tray use a inappropriate tape to seal the wraps together and I think the worst that we saw was people try to use duct tape to tape the wraps together. In four hours time, it already came off. So that's the quickest one. But similar thing happens when they think they use the fabric tape is good enough. After one summer, it just come off and you completely lose the air tightness performance. So use the proper material, complete system is always best option. Yeah. And do you want to comment on that, uh, Sean? Any comments on that? I would, I would say um, definitely the materials, there are much better tapes uh, than others. Some tapes are much better than others. Absolutely. Um, duct tape is not good. Are very good are they? What's that? I've heard pro clima tapes are very good. They are very good. Um, we'll give you a free roll if you, if you uh, want a sample for sure. Um, but uh, more important than just the materials, uh, or as important as the materials, is uh, when you install membranes, for example, membranes uh, can flex very easily, and so they need to have a rigid substrate 
Uh, so there's even code language uh, from abroad that says any load that the air barrier receives must be transferred to uh, its substrate. So basically it has to never be under any strain ever in its lifetime. And that's true for any sort of sealant, actually, uh, that needs to be supported over its lifetime. And that includes expansion and contraction of uh, structural members. So uh, does air tightness suffer over time? I assume that every building uh, gets a little uh, leakier over time. Um, and uh, probably the t deterioration that Joseph's talking about happens quite catastrophically very early. And then uh, it continues to slowly decline after that as well. Um, but I'd say all houses, all buildings uh, slowly get uh, leakier over time. Uh, and there is some more information that I want to share. Um, apart from the property of the material, something may surprise you is the color of the material also can make some change. Um, for example, it's like um, when you apply caulking or the tape, if you have some light color tape or cork, compared to black color, it's a lot easier to pick out uh, imperfection in application. So even the tray, the person who apply can quickly pick up um, some imperfection and fix that on the spot instead of um, waiting for it to flap by the wind, gradually deteriorating. Yep, those are small things, but can help. It's just uh, building on some of these details. Uh, James Cheesewright asked the question, uh, do you ever get membranes or sealing details lift away due to the air pressures applied uh, uh, due to the test? Is it important to think about the direction of airflow or should it work in both directions effectively? Well, let's put it the other way. Usually when we do the pressure testing, we rarely go beyond 75 pascal and we are talking about 45 kilometer wind roughly if your building component on the facade or the roof cannot stand 45 kilometer per hour wind you got bigger problem than air tightness testing yeah, and it's also good that you found it at this point rather than further down the line so yeah. uh, people sometimes say is this going to blow out the windows and they say you better hope it does because then uh, you, uh, then you'll at least know that your windows can't uh, stand up to even a light wind. Fifty pascals is yeah, thirty-three kilometer per hour wind. So um, it better be able to hold that pressure. And um, another one. This is from anonymous attendee, that well-known person. And um, can you? Uh, he said, "Thanks for the presentation. Really helpful." And um, do you agree that until a pleased uh, quantitative test required by the NCC um, and um, designers will still find it hard to convince clients to spend that extra money in non-required tests. Um, I'd be really interested in your view because my, my particular view is that if we, look, if we are focusing on the next generation of well-insulated airtight buildings, we're going to start topping out on energy efficiency through, due to things like HVAC systems and uh, lighting systems, which is where an awful lot of the gain has been made over the last, um, you know, 15 years or something like that. We're starting to, you know, we've got our big data systems, we've got, you know, the best equipment and so on. So if we want to get to the zero carbon side of things, my view is that we need to get better at doing the things that we're not very good at, which is building well insulated airtight buildings. But Sean, can I ask you just to very quickly tell um, uh, the participants, tell us about the legislative journey that you've been on to influence the NCC and where you think it's heading to and why is it do you think that clients are getting more and more interested in their tightness testing? Uh, so first steps, uh, you have to put a lot of pieces in, in place. So Jesse Clark, uh, um, who used to work at CSR and now works at ProClima uh, was instrumental in getting uh, ISO 9972 adopted as an Australian test standard. That's the blower door standard. Uh, that was step one. Step two is getting uh, that mentioned in the code. It's not mandatory, but it's an option. It's in the code and that's actually a big step in the right direction. There's also, um, so whether it makes it into the 2022 uh, code, I'm actually um, not optimistic, although 
I hope that um, maybe the way it works um, sometimes is that individual jurisdictions, like individual states, individual stakeholders, uh, councils, uh, universities, uh, military, Green Star, these are all individual stakeholders who want to see better performance and they can also set an example. So maybe it's not going to come in the building code as from the top down, all right, nation, you have to do air tightness, everyone. Uh, that's uh, sometimes uh, politicians uh, can be scared of doing something like that. So um, it might be the individual states do that or they run pilot programs or they do incentives. There's lots of ways to push the industry. And I am optimistic uh, that we will have uh, steps in the right direction in that way. So whether it's pilot programs or individual councils, individual stakeholders, some universities have air tightness requirements for all of their uh, buildings. Um, schools, so many stakeholders that would really, really benefit from this, especially those that are long-term holders of the property. They'll so see the return it's not, on this. It's not about a compliance thing. Is it about kind of educating clients of the benefits they get? I mean, what, one of the questions that was asked, and maybe it kind of goes allied to this, um, uh, somebody asked the question, uh, assuming a 20-floor commercial building, how long would the construction pro to need a program need to be increased to allow for an air tightness test? But, so maybe you start with the kind of uh, where do we need to educate the market? And then what, what does it actually mean in terms of a, an average building? How, how long does it take to, does it add on much to be able to um, uh, undertake air tightness testing? Well, if, uh, Joseph. How long does it take to do an air tightness test? Well, for a 20-story building, I think the most additional time is two days. One day, we come in and pick out, trying to check, do a final checkup to see if the building is ready. We tell the builder what they need to fix, get ready before we come to do the test, and the test is only one day. And then, and then, and then we're going to order all of our crap again. You could probably allocate another day to that. But there's nothing to do with the builder. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, that's no time at all in, in, in compared to, to the benefits that you can actually get. The other thing I've heard is somebody's told me that if you say that you are going to undertake an air tightness test as, you know, that is part of the contract, and you don't even have to put it down what the number is going to be, you're going to get a better building anyway because the builders don't want to be embarrassed by that. Is that an urban story or is that true? Um, I think the answer is yes and no. Depends on the attitude of the site manager. Usually the story always come to like this. The first time we met the site manager, if he tells me he's um, nervous, he worry he's not going to do a good job, then it will turn out to be a good building. For those, oh, I know this, I did a building like that, I, I know how to build air tights and it's very common if they are twice the target. I would say, uh, Jeff, one um, way, one approach to regulation, uh, and one of the reasons, one of the powers of uh, blower door testing is that it, uh, sh the act of blower door testing, put it under pressure, allows you to find and, and identify leakage. So that is an educational opportunity for everyone involved. Um, but some of the creative approaches to regulation from around the world, um, I take the Seattle example uh, often, where they required a mandatory testing. You have to do a test. They required this for a long time. You have to do a test, but then there was actually no target to pass uh, for many years. And you'd say, what's the point of that? What's making, what's the point of making me do a mandatory test, but then giving me no target that I have to pass? Well, two things. One is that you get the education of the builders. And the other is that uh, they start uh, comparing their results to each other. It's not even that you have to disclose things. You basically, uh, if you have the Atma Lodgement database and you get all this test data in there and you say, well, the average in your area is five, but you're at 12 then all of a sudden, even if you don't tell anyone else what your result was, if you're the only one who hears it, you will, you should feel ashamed that you are doing 12 and everyone else is doing five. That's the power of, of this, uh, just education, basically illumination, education, disclosure. It's all uh, very helpful. 
and their soft it's their soft ways to uh, lead the industry, not so much the top down heavy handed uh, regulation. Well, look, I, I went to um, to a presentation not so long ago, which was put on by the master builders, but I've also seen one that's been done by the HIA, where they've actually been giving some presentations on some of the trades around um, air tightness testing. So do you think is there, are you starting to see a, a greater knowledge and a greater interest in the, in the trades about a, improving skills around that? Uh, myself, well, um, honestly, we, I think John can say this, and I've heard from others that they're getting more, uh, the ATMA testers are getting more requests all the time. So that's very encouraging, a request for, for testing. And uh, we do continually keep reaching out to HIA and MBA um, to try to uh, build alliances where we can, because we know that they want to help uh, promote best practice uh, in their members, and uh, we want to help them do that. So um, there's always more work to be done, but um, we're making some progress. What do you think, uh, John and Joseph? Are you starting to see um, uh, more knowledge and interest around air tightness, designing for air tightness and air tightness testing in the, um, uh, amongst the trades? Well, that, that's a very interesting question. For some reason, from our observation, the trades working in data center, aquatic center, they pick up the skill a lot faster than all the other building types. Hmm. So you it's think that there, there's, there's a real opportunity for folks to kind of go and pick that up. What about, um, so if you were to give some advice on, um, you know, HVAC engineers and they wanted to go and learn about improving detailing for air tightness, where would they go? Where is it? What's, what are the good courses that are around? How do they learn what's best practice? Well, unfortunately, I don't see there is any um, course focusing on building services engineers. Um, if you are talking about architectural or even structural engineer detailing, there is a fair bit of um, books and even some online courses you can get from uh, um, organizations like Passive House Association. They offer quite a bit of um, design workshops and training programs on that. But um, building services engineer focus, I, I haven't come across any. But welcome Joseph, to talk to us. Yeah, Joseph should do them, I would yep. say. Well, maybe we need the SIBS course on air tightness, uh, designing for air tightness for um, uh, SIBS members. I mean, maybe that's uh, one thing we could. Yeah, we, we, we are certainly interested in working out a CPD program, for example, with SIBSI or um, ERA. Mm. And look, Good. just to, uh, I mean, we're, we're sort of getting a bit close here. I would say to folk, uh, if you want to go and ask questions, please put them into the Q&A box and I will go and ask them. Um, Otherwise, I'll just keep on making up things that I'm interested in. Um, so one of the things I'd like to ask you, John, is, I mean, you, I am so impressed by the sheer number of videos that you have made on, um, uh, on, on insulation and air tightness testing. And they're really good. They're fantastic. I really enjoy them. Good. Where's the passion come from? Why do you do it? Uh, well, why do we do it? Probably... Um... I don't know, to progress the industry. Um, we do it because we like and enjoy doing it. I mean, Joseph's um, been a lot on a lot of the videos as well. Um, and we, we just enjoy doing it. It's good for our brand as well. So why not? Absolutely. Well, I have to say the, the last one I saw was the one on your own house. And oh, yeah. definitely... Um, <laughs> you know, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, li you know, living the dream yourself. I mean, I think yeah. it, it's a really great example where you show that it, kind of graph of how it had gone down from 30 air, uh, what was it? Uh, 30 ICH down yeah, 30 to 30 air changes down to five or something like that. Three, three. So, and that's with plaster. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, no, that was, that was very impressive with a whole load of different kind of things that are there. Um, 
just that question you did bring up, actually, uh, Joseph, you mentioned the um, not very good qualities of core filled block work um, uh, at uh, walls of actually um, producing airtight construction, which cannot be pretty important when you come to compartment walls and things like that. What would you recommend? Is that plastering the walls? Is that what you have to do to get the air tightness to come well, in? The, the simplest way to deal with that is just put three coats of undercoat of paint. Simple as that is already substantially reduced the permeability through the block wall. It's, it's, not, it's not expensive, no rocket science. So in, in that video that we cover for block work and you see it pouring off the face of the, of the block work like a waterfall, we actually put on um, two coats of paint and it was a substantial difference in the, uh, the leakage of that material. Um, look, can I ask a question of you, um, Sean? Um, you know, looking after asthma, how do you, can you talk a little bit about the process of becoming an air tightness tester and how do you know, how do you make sure that there's good quality work being done on, um, you know, like the work that uh, John and Joseph are doing versus you know, some shonks coming in. How do we avoid, uh, you know, a pink bat for air tightness testing? Um, well, there's a, a couple things. So uh, one is that the whole scheme is uh, really empowered by the data. Um, and so uh, the more tests that come in, the more that we have for comparison to others, uh, the more we can, uh, the data can be reviewed for consistency. So, um, you can do the tests now. Um, actually, Atma is developing an app to do the tests entirely wirelessly um, and then upload them to their lodgement uh, database entirely wirelessly. So that's, uh, and then that can uh, be sent to the database and then get a quick check on some basic uh, parameters of quality. So did you reach sufficient pressure? Uh, we're using they can have the uh, equipment there uh, on their catalog, whether it's been calibrated or not. Um, is the the R squared correlate coefficient of determination? Is it good data? Uh, is there are there sufficient data points? All this stuff can be done uh, practically instantly by a computer by their computer. Uh, so, uh, in terms of data quality, uh, there are a lot of checks built right into the Atma Lodgement system. So, that's pretty. Uh, uh, gives me a lot of confidence about this. And even things like timestamps and, uh, well, it's, we're actually only seeing the beginning of uh, where this can go and I'm, I'm pretty excited. We can really get a handle on, on uh, the quality of testing. I mean, uh, the, I think the invitation we had um, on, that was on the Eventbrite website, I put a photograph, John, of you with some of the uh, the uh, the fans that you have uh, put in place. How many fans do you have, and what kind of size of building can you now test with that 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 the number of fans that you? Have? I think in total with our duct testers, I believe we're probably in the 24, 24 fans, including the duct test. But if you're talking building pressurization fans, twenty two. Yeah, twenty two. There you go. So that's 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 enormous. I mean. I've seen some, uh, for folk who don't uh, know, I mean, you can, there's some videos on on, uh, on YouTube where you can look at testing of some of these are massive, absolutely massive uh, warehouses and those yeah. truckloads of fans on that. But Apparently, you, if- You um, absolutely do that with your, with the number of fans you have, couldn't you guys? Yeah, apparently I was told that if you dropped efficiency matrix in the UK, we would be number three in our capacity. Well, that's awesome that we have that kind of capacity in, in this part here. So can I just, from your perspective, as, a, as folk working in the industry, um, can you talk a little bit about Atma and what, it, what, it, what it's helping you to do in the industry and where you hope it goes to? Um, that's for me? Yep. Oh, sorry, I thought it was for Sean. No, 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 I know about him, I've asked him. Sorry. Um, so with regards to, um, so, so, you, about, so regarding ATMA, so yeah. what was How, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a member of ATMA, mm -hmm. how does that help you? And how does that, 
how does the Atma as an industry association help yeah. you? What advantages does it bring you? Well, it's just, it's, where would you like to see it go to? The, the data yeah. that is collected by Atma is very powerful. And, um, and also the, the guidelines behind Atma for ensuring that what testing is done is, can be replicated um, is absolutely critical for any of this air tightness testing to mean anything. So we're always trying to do everything by the book. And when we quote and look at jobs, we want to make sure that we're getting the best result for the building. And um, so, yeah, Atma is just extremely compatible with that. And, um, and it's something that we just need to make sure that we, um, that we, that we can propagate it and make sure that it becomes a guiding force for the, uh, for the blower door industry here in Australia and New Zealand. And not just that, um, I, I would also like to um, put some extra and my two cents on it. Yep. It is not only for the air tightness tester, but also good for the clients and the consultants. Mm. Because in the past, some cowboy did tests with exceptionally good results that doesn't reflect in the real building. If those kind of message gets spread between um, within the industry, you either get two outcomes. One, um, the clients start to asking the good quality builder to match the target that may not even be possible in their budget. But they say, how, how come other company can get to a one, mm. but you can't. Mm -hmm. The other is, um, it, it's um, the clients start to say, well, air tightness do me no good. They say it's a extremely airtight building. How come I still feel all the drop? It, mm. it, let's stop wasting money on doing this right. Yeah. Mm. Look, um, it's good to police that. Absolutely. I'm going to, uh, I'm, we're going to have to finish pretty soon because uh, it's time to kick on. But look, uh, one of the things I would say, I mean, we've obviously, a lot of the um, uh, folk from SIDS who've been on this call have been, um, you know, we, we've talked about uh, things at the commercial scale, large commercial buildings, large educational buildings and so on. And we deliberately haven't put anything in on housing. But given the fact we all live in houses and a lot of us, because we have been working from home um, for the last three months and so on, are actually starting to understand how comfortable our houses are during the day. Um, I would suggest that uh, there is a great opportunity to go and educate uh, folk around the importance around air tightness testing and improving air tightness testing for new buildings because a lot of the uh, new homes, because a lot of the studies that have been shown, that you've shown, have been done at a domestic level and show that we're not very good at building well insulated airtight homes. And as a result of which, a lot of times folk actually don't understand what it is to have comfort without chucking a lot of heat or a, or, or, or a, lot, of, uh, or, or a lot of cooling at the buildings. Whereas if you go into homes that are built in, in Europe, uh, um, uh, you know, Sweden, Denmark, uh, Northern America, various other places like that, where, where traditionally it's been colder or hotter outside, um, there is a greater perception of what it is to deliver well insulated airtight buildings. And if I think about where we're heading to with climate change, with the um, number of uh, hot summers that we're going to experience. Well, do you want to just talk a little bit, just as the kind of final comments from from uh, from uh, both John and Joseph and also Sean, what's the role of, say, bringing in mandatory pressure testing for houses could do, uh, and, and maybe also thermography um, could do to improve uh, uh, house building standards and increase resilience? So, I mean, we're, we're a pretty strong uh, believer that thermography can um, add value to insulation quality. 
um, and just the quality of, of the trades and the skills of, tra of, of installing insulation in a lot of these homes. Some of the things that we've seen are a joke. <laughs> that yeah, it can be really, really bad. Um, with regards to air tightness testing, it has the potential to change certain products that are attaching to the building envelope to um, heat and cool the, the conditioned space, um, including exhaust and ventilation systems. Um, and then, yeah, obviously it's got the potential to um, reduce the leakage rates of buildings to help them perform better in conjunction with a more consistent thermal barrier. Joseph, do you want to add anything about the potential around um, of houses and air tightness sets and what that could do for uh, both new and existing homes? Well, I, I think it has a lot to do in the bridging the gap of the expected design performance and the actual building. Like I said earlier, all of the houses being built now should at least be a six, if not a seven star building. But how come we keep hearing complaint after complaint that these homes are not comfortable? It has a lot to do with the quality and workmanship and doing a air tightness testing and also the thermography is a really good proxy to show um, how careful, how diligent the tray and the builder is in the delivery of the home. I think that people don't necessarily understand that a Natter's test is a theoretical construct. It's a, a computer program put in. There is no performance validation, not like a Green Star test or a Well test, where you actually have a design and build component. Yep. So there is actually no as-built test for homes, is there? Nothing. Sean, do you want to make a comment on that as in a kind of, from an Atma point? I mean, you've been on the journey for a long time campaigning not only commercial buildings, but also around uh, about homes and improving them and about what the role of air tightness testing could be. Sure. Um, I keep, I need a good uh, illustration to show the energy savings tree. And uh, if we have a tree of energy savings, uh, if you're right, Jeff, uh, a lot of the gains we've seen, we pat ourselves on the back about uh, how great we've done with um, energy efficiency in these past 10 years. But I'd say we already got all the easy stuff, like uh, better water heaters. Maybe there's still some progress, but uh, lighting, absolutely. LEDs, all right, that's easy and cheap energy savings. Um, now it's the hard stuff. It's some of the more expensive building envelope uh, uh, line items, like windows, uh, single pane windows. I can't believe that they're still, still so widely used here. Um, and uh, some workmanship things like uh, insulation, installation, and duct leakage, and uh, building envelope leakage, air leakage. Those are things that uh, some of those, uh, building envelope leakage in particular, is such a juicy, low-hanging fruit. It is going to be a pleasure to pick that one and then see the amazing improvements in terms of energy efficiency, comfort, uh, acoustic quality, pest control, um, indoor air quality, actually, because ventilation systems are actually, actually going to be doing something now. Uh, there are so many uh, benefits from doing this uh, that um, I'm pretty, pretty excited. And uh, one more thing, though, I think if we, we keep hearing about uh, net zero energy targets, and it just is astounding to me that the um, uh, building ministers forum and, and uh, codes councils say, well, we're setting a trajectory for uh, by 2030, we want net zero construction. Well, I'd say you better get your act together. If you want to get to net zero yeah. by then, you're going to have some big problems if you try to get there without doing air tightness, like adding more insulation. You're just, and uh, you're just going to end up with uncomfortable moldy houses. So you need to start doing something about build quality and air tightness is one of the easiest ones. Well, listen, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you sincerely for giving your time up today. And also just to thank all of the SIBS members and guests who've come on this presentation. 
The one thing I would say of you, anyone who's attended this today is in a much better position than the folk who didn't attend it to be able to go and position yourselves to be leading designers or contractors um, uh, designing low energy buildings. Because um, as I've said, and Sean and others have said, um, we've done the easy step. The next step that's going to be done over the next few years, which is getting detailing for air tightness and insulation. That is the step that's going to make the difference to actually being able to um, uh, deliver zero carbon buildings and actually create a more resilient environment for, uh, for our clients and for our families. So um, thank you so, so much for the time that you've given. Um, everyone, before you go, please take a screenshot of this uh, screen because if you want to meet the best in the business, just send an email to Mr. Maxwell to John and to Joseph, because you're talking to people who really know what they're talking uh, talking about. And um, I thank you. Thanks again for everyone giving up their time. Have a, a, a safe evening, an enjoyable evening. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next month for the next uh, SIBS Victoria um, uh, uh, technical presentation, which I think is all about um, uh, next generation BIM and digital twins. So if you're interested in that, um, keep an eye on our website and Eventbrite and you'll see that coming out. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you.